Okay, guys, welcome back. The last thing I wanted to talk about with the hemodynamic section is the concept of what's going on in, in the actual capillary. Okay, so if we were to draw, oh, let me change color so this would be prettier, I suppose. So if we draw a big capillary here, okay, so we, we know that we've already gotten through the pre arterial sphincter, we've already gotten through the arterioles and pre-arterial sphincter, we've already auto-regulated all we need, and now the question is how do we decide what uh, gets, you know, extruded across the membrane and what stays? So we know that the capillary is um, lined with epithelial cells and that those epithelial cells um, allow lipophilic things to cross over so oxygen and you know things like that don't have a problem getting across um, there's also with clefts within these epi um, you know within the margins of these epithelial cells that allow water and other nutrients to come across um, but what doesn't go across are um, highly negative charged things like protein. Uh, protein can't come across for a couple of reasons. It's charge and number two, it can't come across because of its size. So protein tends to stay inside the vessel. Okay. Now when you get into the um, the capillary, one thing you'll find in physiology is that everything tries to maintain some sort of homeostasis. So I like to think about it like a seesaw. Okay, uh, so you know, in equals out. You, whatever comes in must come out, or it, you know, solutes must maintain a certain concentration on each side of the membrane, or whatever. So your your system is always trying to maintain a balance between two forces, and so essentially what's happening is I'm going to erase um, some of this because it's going to get in our way in just a second. <clears throat> So what's happening in the capillary is you have um, a competition almost with what's called starling forces. And this is the same starling that invented your curve, your starling curve. Whoop, that looks like it has a little aneurysm to it. Okay, uh, the same um, doctor who, who invented Frank Starling mechanism or one of the you know, Frank Otto Frank and then Starling. Um, he came up with a concept of what exactly is going on in the capillary itself. And so you, ha you essentially have four forces that are always battling um, to, to try to create flow across the membrane. So we're going to call flow across the membrane, and we're going to label that J. So J is the physiologic symbol for uh, fluid movement. Okay? Now, <clears throat> um, Every capillary, and this doesn't apply. This not only applies to capillaries in your body, but it also applies to you know glomerular capillaries and and you know alveolar capillaries and all these things. So all capillaries um, exhibit these forces. It's just the numbers within the capillaries are going to be different for each uh, organ system. But each organ, uh, each capillary bed has the ability to um, uh, has an intrinsic. Uh, what they call filtration coefficient. It's just a constant that has to do with that particular um, capillary bed. And the uh, the filtration constant, uh, I'm sorry, fil filtration coefficient is symbolized by a KF, filtration constant. And um, it basically um, symbolizes the hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic, oh, missed a U there. Okay, hydraulic conductivity. How well does it conduct water across the membrane? Okay, so this is a given, and any problem that you ever work in physiology will have this KF value provided for you. What they're going to ask you to do is figure out J, and that's where you have to know what these forces do. So let's talk about the forces. The first force is the um, capillary hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure inside the capillary. This pressure is always trying to push fluid out, okay, and so it favors filtration across the membrane. So let's say this is the cell down here and this is the blood. Okay. So the hydrostatic pressure found within the capillary is always trying to push fluid out or favoring filtration. Now it is, if we were to truly draw this, let's say this is the arterial end and this is the venous end, okay? Um, your hydrostolic hydros sorry, your hydrostatic pressure um, 
on, on either end, if, so if I were to squeeze the vessel here and cause an obstruction, there'd be a backflow, meaning the hydrostatic pressure would uh, increase. Or if I were to increase the blood pressure or volume coming in, the hydrostatic pressure would uh, increase. Increases in venous pressure have a greater effect on this uh, hydrostatic pressure because the pre-arterial sphincter is able to auto-regulate. Okay, so if there's getting too much pressure anyway, auto-regulation would have taken over and tried to prevent some of that. So the biggest influence necessary on uh, hydrostatic capillary pressure is venous backup, so to speak. Okay, the uh, next um, pressure favoring um, filtration is the oncotic pressure felt within the interstitial space, okay? And that is a product of protein in this interstitial space. Well, we just said protein usually doesn't come across the capillary membrane, but it there are some small proteins that have the ability to, and because they're in this interstitial space, most of them are taken up by lymphatic systems. And so the protein content that is left exerts a narcotic pressure which tends to pull um, because protein is so large it tends to pull fluid towards it so you have these two forces here that are actually favoring filtration so if we change color here just to make it simple um, you have the exact same forces opposing filtration from the other end so you have a pressure in the interstitium trying to oppose filtration, trying to uh, prevent things from coming across this membrane. You also have um, a pulling force of the protein that is still in here, and that is the oncotic pressure felt within the capillary. So essentially what you have is these pushing and pulling forces, this seesaw effect across the capillary membrane to affect flow. And the idea is you're wanting to figure out how much flow is actually occurring across this membrane. So the formula is um, J or flow equals the constant Kf. All right, then you've got to sum all these partners so that these two are married and these two are married. So you have the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary, it's a positive because it's favoring um, filtration. So we can draw a little positive there if you want. And then you have the interstitial pressure that's opposing filtration, so it's a negative. So you add your two pressures together. And then you add, um, you take the difference uh, and, and you consider the oncotic pressures. So the oncotic pressure of the capillary, okay, so it's favoring filtration, so it's a, uh, I'm sorry, it's opposing filtration, so it's a negative value, and then the negative um, oncotic of the interstitium, okay? So this is how we get this. So if you change this algebraically, you end up getting this. That's why this was a kind of a hesitation here. Okay, and that might make more sense because the, the oncotic pressure felt in the capillary is opposing filtration and the oncotic pressure in the interstitial space is favoring. So if you change the algebraic signs here, uh, then you can add these up. So all you're doing is taking the, 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 sum, the sum or the difference or the, doing the basic arithmetic of all these pressures and then multiplying it times your hydraulic conductivity or your Kf and that would give you your flow. Okay, and that's it. So um, if you were to, now there are some things to take into consideration, okay? Um, <clears throat> if there, um, your, your protein within your, um, your capillary here, there's, a, there's something called the Donnan effect. So the protein is normally negative charged, okay? And it attracts positively charged molecules. I'm just going to draw sodiums here. But in doing so, it increases its effective size and thus contributes a, a kind of a skewed value for oncotic pressure. And the same thing happens in the interstitium. So you have to be aware that these are estimations uh, at best, but they're nonetheless still playing forces that are uh, going across the capillary. So um, if I were to say you increased your arterial pressure, then that should increase. 
um, hydrostatic pressure. If I were to increase your venous pressure, meaning you have backflow, that would increase your inner uh, your hydrostatic pressure. If I were to let's say give you uh, renal failure, uh, I'm sorry, not renal failure, hepatic failure, your proteins are made in your your liver, and so if you have no protein in your capillary, you have no oncotic pressure in your capillary. Therefore, this side of the equation wins, and your hydrostatic pressure wins, and you start to extrude fluid out of the capillary. And this is why people get ascites, is because this fluid found in their portal vein is that has no protein in it. And it has a high um, uh, hydrostatic pressure because the liver is cirrhosed and it can't get blood back up uh, to the liver. So the hydrostatic pressure is winning, pushing fluid out into the belly, and you get ascites. That's the clinical significance of that. Um, now, what if I had a situation where I had lymphatic blockage? Um, and I let's say I had a mastectomy or whatever, and I and I have poor lymph flow back to the central circulation. Well, how is that going to play a role? Well, if I have inadequate lymphatic function, then this oncotic pressure, the proteins aren't getting washed out, and so the oncotic pressure in the um, interstitium wins. And now I'm pulling more fluid across the uh, capillary membrane, and then before I get uh, lymphedema in my arm, um, or you know wherever, I, or the upper chest. So there are several clinical conditions that can exist that would prevent me or promote filtration or absorption depending on which um, one I've, I've messed up. So um, just um, to keep in mind, now the two things, there are, there are clinical situations where I can actually change the KF. So what if I had um, inflammation and the capillary permeability got huge and these endo there's a big space between these endothelial cells now so now more stuff can go across this membrane without being selective uh, for the endothelial cells or if I had anaphylaxis and histamine caused massive vasodilation and caused increased capillary permeability that that also too could change just the KF and not have anything necessarily to do with my starling forces um, if I had a burn or whatever um, KF also changes okay so um, when you see oncotic pressure, think protein, and if you have too much or too little, what would that do to your forces? And then if you had changes in your pressure, and really what I think about when I have changes in my pressure is there's two ways to change pressure. I change the size of the box, okay? As I increase the box size, pressure goes down. If I lower the box size, pressure goes up and then I also change the fluid content within the box itself. If I put a ton of fluid in just this little box and don't change the box, the, f the pressure should go up. If I take all that fluid out like giving Lasix or whatever, then that pressure would go down. So think about in terms of pressure, uh, I'm sorry, volume, it changes the hydrostatic pressure felt across the capillary and therefore um, changes um, the filtration or reabsorption depending on um, which force seems to be winning. And then if it, it favors filtration, you put a positive sign. If it opposes filtration, you put a negative sign. Change the signs algebraically, add them all up, multiply them times your KF, and you get the flow. Okay? Um, pre so when you get your answer, if the answer is, let's say, 8 millimeters of mercury, then you are filtering across the membrane. Okay, if it's negative six, let's say millimeters of mercury, then you're opposing filtration, and therefore you're mostly reabsorbing. Okay, now you'll find that you tend to do uh, more filtering on the arterial side and more reabsorbing on the venous side because as you, more fluid comes out that um, concentrates the protein concentration on the venous side as we pass through this capillary and therefore more the oncotic pressure tends to win over here and so more fluid is reabsorbed and so forth and so on. But that's, that's fine because I want to deliver nutrients on this side and I want to reabsorb nutrients on this side. Okay, so um, it is, it's a good thing to have happen. Um, but it has to happen within its uh, normal physiology. Okay, um, so if you can understand this, and then understand that this 
are this concept of auto regulation and then putting uh, stuff back up in the in the venous return sending it back to the heart that entire circuit that is how hemodynamics play a role in your normal uh, circulatory system okay so this ends this lecture series and I hope to see you guys back next time